Uh, okay, so let's, we're going to continue, this is our third lecture, but we're going to continue our last lecture talking about molecular orbitals. And specifically, instead of talking about the energies of frontier molecular orbitals, I want to talk about the shape of molecular orbitals today. Uh, and this interplay between uh, how to think about the importance of frontier molecular orbitals and their interactions versus the importance of charge in chemical reactions. And so I just put up a, a reaction for you to consider. There's nothing special about this or, or unique. Um, it's a reaction of a diazonium ion with uh, parole. And so um, how do you approach something like this? I, I picked this because I didn't think this was the kind of reaction that you covered in a lot of your classes. Um, and so let's talk about what's important when we want to uh, 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 make some predictions about this reaction. And let me just remind you of what I said on the first lecture and then I repeat it again on the second lecture. Is when I ask you to explain or predict or organic chemistry, when you want to make some prediction about which pathways are fast and which pathways are slow, there's going to be three things that I want you to consider. And those three things are sterics. So we want to think about all the steric interactions in these two molecules as they get closer together. Uh, and I think with this T-butyl group here, you can make some guesses about what that's going to do uh, about the chemical reactivity uh, of that parole. There's another factor for us to consider, and it's some sort of summation uh, of all of the orbital interactions. And we said that, that we could decompose that into two components, orbital overlap and then some inverse dependence on, on the difference in energies between the energy of some highest occupied molecular orbital and some lowest unoccupied uh, molecular orbital. And then finally, we have to think about the interactions of charges. Okay, so how do we think about these three things? How do we approach this problem? So let's go ahead and start off by enumerating. Um, first of all, I, I want to point out that in most, and I think I've already said this before, in most organic chemical reactions, we're interested in forming bonds. We're not interested in steric interactions that determine protein folding. We're not interested in formation of ions like, and salts like sodium chloride. We're interested in forming covalent bonds, usually to carbon. That's, that's the area of organic chemistry. And so we're typically focusing on this one term here. We're not interested in why things don't react. We're interested in why things form bonds. So that's usually MOs, is usually the dominant term. So let's stop and talk about this in particular. So bond formation uh, is usually dominated by that middle term. by the interaction of molecular orbitals, by the overlap and by the difference in energy. You want high energy nucleophiles, low energy uh, uh, electrophiles. So let's go ahead and start off enumerating what steps we should take in order to think about this. The first thing that you need to do, and you learned this back in sophomore organic chemistry, is you need to identify both the nucleophile and the electrophile. Sometimes I'll write plus next to this, this symbol EL for electrophile. So I think that you guys could probably do this. Which of these do you think is the electrophile? <clears throat> there's a diazonium and there's a parole. The yeah, the diazonium. I think everybody in here, right, if I made that into a quiz, everybody in here would get 100% on that. And the nucleophile is going to be the parole here. And maybe it's the positive charge that gives that away. So that's the easy part, identifying the nucleophile and the electrophile. But then the second part of this is we need to predict the regiochemistry. In other words, okay, now that I know that this is the electrophile, which end reacts? Maybe that's not so obvious. Maybe it is obvious. Maybe the plus charge tells you which end is the most reactive, or maybe it doesn't. I think for the parole, it's a lot harder for us to judge which atom on that, on that system is the most reactive. Maybe that's not so easiest. I mean, if you avoid looking at the T-butyl, of course, that's going to dominate your thinking, and it shouldn't. But if you think about that parole, that's not so easy for you to predict what's the most reactive end of that molecule, which atom is the most likely to attack that diazonium. So how do you predict regiochemistry? And we've got just two simple rules for us. Look at the HOMO and look at the LUMO. Look at the HOMO in the nucleophile and the LUMO in the electrophile. 
These are the molecular orbitals, the highest occupied molecular orbital. So let me re-sketch an orbital interaction diagram for you right next to this. Right, when we think about the orbital interactions when two molecules get closer and closer together, for the nucleophile, that parole, if I draw out these sort of orbitals and I'll just sort of sketch some sort of um, fictional diagram, and I can't possibly draw all of the orbitals out. So I'll draw the filled orbitals here, and then up here I've got the unfilled orbitals. And then over on this side, I'll draw some orbitals for the diazonium ion. And I'll just write etc. because I can't draw all of the orbitals. These are just orbital energy levels. So the important thing here is I, I should come over here and find between these two reactants, one of these two reactants has a high energy pair of electrons. That's the parole. If I've sketched this correctly, the parole should have one pair of electrons that's more reactive than any pair of electrons in that diazonium. And there is an orbital that's associated with that pair of electrons. That's the highest occupied molecular orbital. And then if we come over to, to the electrophile, there must be some empty orbital that's easiest to put electrons into. Easier than any other molecular orbital, even though there are lots of empty molecular orbitals in the nucleophile, but there must be one empty orbital in the electrophile that is really low in energy. Um, and that's why we assign that to be, so, uh, to be the, the electrophile. So once we've got some sort of a diagram, how do we predict which end of this or which parts of these molecules are most likely to form bonds, carbon-nitrogen bonds? Well, what we need to do is we need to take a close look at the shape of these. We need to look at the shape of the highest occupied molecular orbital and the shape of the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So that's our goal. So there's definitely going to be some low energy interaction. A high energy HOMO and a low energy LUMO means that this gap is small. Delta E is small, right? And if the denominator to this term is small, it's that that makes this a big term, that makes this energetically favorable for orbitals to interact. So we need to sort of focus in now and get used to looking at the shape of HOMOs and the shape of LUMOs. Those are going to predict which part of these molecules are the most reactive. That's how we get those predictions out. <coughs> so let's get, let's get some experience looking at the shape of molecular orbitals. Okay, I want to draw a series of interactions and then we can just talk about regiochemistry. This idea that there's something about the shape of, of molecular orbitals that allows us to think about regiochemistry. Let's think about alkenes or pi systems uh, more precisely. Let's think about pi systems and their interactions with electrophiles and nucleophiles. So if I think about um, some sort of a nucleophile adding to an alkene, how should I think about that? I know you covered this in detail last quarter in Chem 201. I hope you have some ideas about how nucleophiles interact with alkenes. Electrophiles, maybe you also have some ideas. Did you guys cover alkenes? Maybe you did. Half chair conformations, conformational analysis. How can I decide about trajectories when I think about the interaction of some sort? When this pi system acts as a nucleophile instead of an electrophile, how can I think about the interaction between that pi system? What's the preferred trajectory? Is there some sort of bergy dunitz angle that determines what sort of angle I should attack from? Um, there's all these questions that are embedded in the shape of the molecular orbital. Okay, let's add a third carbon. So instead of a two carbon pi system, let's go ahead and think about a three carbon <coughs> pi system, like an allo cation. Right, why, if I were to draw all the different modes of reactivity, what do you think about this one? Why wouldn't I add to the middle carbon? And I know you're going to, to focus on that charge. Well, I have to add where the charge is the biggest because there's a plus. Why not? Why not add here to the middle carbon? Is it simply because the charge is there? Or if I draw out some sort of an allyl anion and I think about allyl as a nucleophile, a three carbon pi system, is it possible that the middle carbon, and I won't draw an arrow pushing for this, could react with an electrophile? faster than the two ends. Why not? Why is it that that's not, and you know that this is not the preferred mode of reactivity in either case, I hope. 
But the question is why? And what's your rationale? Let's go ahead and extend this to a four atom pi system, a diene. If I've got the right set of atoms here, maybe not all carbon, um, the nucleophiles will add to this rapidly. And so the question is, which end do you add to on, on a diene? Where do you add with dienes? Should you add to the end? Should you add to the, one of the two middle carbons? And if so, why do you say that? And I can make the, the same sort of an analysis if I add an electrophile. I'll just write E plus here. Suppose I were to form a bond. Why not form a bond with one of the two middle carbons rather than the ends? Is it sterics that determines that? So I've done two carbon, three carbon, or, or two atom, three atom, four atom pi systems. The last system really you need to know and just sort of memorize the examples with is a five atom pi system. So if I draw out a pentadienyl cation and I think about nucleophiles adding to this, where does the nucleophile want to add? Does it add to the middle? Or did we, al we already drew some conclusions about how bad it is to add to the middle uh, of this allyl system. Should we add to the middle of that pentadienyl system? And if so, why not? Let's think about that as a nucleophile instead of an electrophile. And so which end of a pentadienyl system, a five carbon or five atom pi system is most reactive? Okay, in all of these, the answer is embedded or predictable based on looking at the shape of the molecular orbitals. Right? If, in all the lower cases here, I've got nucleophiles. In all the above cases, I've got electrophiles. And so that means we ought to be able to look at the HOMO and the LUMO and make strong predictions about why these things should be true or not true. And so let's start off by doing that. I'm going to sketch out um, those pi systems that correspond to the HOMO and the LUMO. And you learned about this last quarter. So let me do this. Hopefully some of this is a reminder, but I want to focus your attention on the stuff that's important. And so when did you look up, learn about this? You learned about this last quarter when you learned about Huckel theory. And so what is Huckel theory? Huckel theory is mixing a bunch of p orbitals together so that you can get pi-like molecular orbitals out. So you mix a bunch of p orbitals together, you get a bunch of pi-like molecular orbitals out. And, and somewhere, what drops out of Huckel theory is something called coefficients. It's a term that I'll use and it seems a little bit cryptic because I, I'm not walking you through a Huckel theory the way Professor Jarvo did. But uh, essentially, Huckel theory tells you about the size of the p orbitals on each atom in a molecular orbital. So if I focus, if I draw out the HOMO uh, of some sort of uh, a pi system and I draw out the LUMO, each one of those MOs will have a set of coefficients that, that are associated with it. So let's go ahead and draw out some of these. Um, for example, the HOMO for a, a, a simple pi system for an alkene. And that's the filled orbital. And the thing to, for me to pay attention to here with the simple carbon-carbon bond is the phasing. We need to really focus in on that. When we talk about pericyclic reactions, that phasing is going to be super important. Okay, so here's the HOMO and here's the LUMO for a simple two carbon pi system. And immediately we are beset with predictions. We're empowered to make predictions just from this simple picture of a pi system. So one of these predictions you learned about last quarter when you talked about Berge Dunnett's approach of nucleophiles. Just with this simple picture of these two sets of p orbitals, you already know that nucleophiles prefer to attack from this special trajectory called the Berge Dunnett's angle that avoids uh, um, unproductive or anti productive anti phasing interactions with the nucleophile. That's why you don't attack from the top. That's why you don't attack from the side. You attack from this 109 degree angle out of plane. But what's important here is when I come back over to this system here with the electrophile, there is no Berge Dunnett's angle for alkenes. When you bring electrophiles into alkenes, what's their preferred trajectory? It's not a 109 degree angle. What this picture tells you is that if you come in with some sort of an empty orbital, and I don't have room here to draw my E plus, I'll try to sketch it in there. 
The prediction is you want to come in from the center of that pi system, not from a Berge Dunnett's angle. And all you had to do was draw out the phasing in order to make that prediction. So that's the preferred trajectory for an electrophile, straight on top. You kind of knew that. Back in sophomore organic chemistry, you knew that if you had Br2, you make a bromonium ion. You attack from the center. That's true for enolates as well, with a little bit of distortion. OK, let's talk about the, the MOs for a, a three-atom system. And for a three-atom system, I'm just going to draw this, this one orbital that's right in the middle in terms of energy. One that can be either the, the HOMO or the LUMO, depending on where, how you fill it with electrons. So there's some lower energy orbital below the HOMO or, or the LUMO. If I take all the electrons out, actually, this is the most, and have a carbocation, then this would be the LUMO. So let me go ahead and phase one of these. I'll phase this um, with the correct phasing. And whether I call that a cation or an anion just depends on whether I put zero or two electrons in this orbital. It's the same. The important thing is the phasing is the same. And immediately, I'm able to make a prediction. So the question was, why don't you add to the middle carbon of an allyl cation? It is not because of the charge. It's not. The reason you don't add to the middle carbon of an allyl cation is there's the, the LUMO is small there. There's no way to interact with that orbital when there's nothing there. And if you want to think about the interaction of an allyl anion, where I put two electrons in there, it's nucleophilic on the end because that's where the electrons spend their time. It has nothing to do with those charges that we drew here. That's not why you don't add to the middle carbon. You could have predicted this based on the phasing and based on Huckel theory. OK, let's come back and draw out the, the orbitals for a diene. Let me see if I can sketch this out here. And I'm going to be really picky now about the size of these p orbitals that I'm drawing here. Over each one of these carbon atoms, I'm drawing a p orbital. So I'm going to draw really big p orbitals on the ends. And then I'm going to correctly draw, and I'm going to overemphasize this so that it's really dramatic, the middle two carbons, the middle two atoms have smaller p orbitals, smaller coefficients. I'm going to mix less p character. This is kind of like a recipe. How much p character am I going to mix on this carbon to make this molecular orbital? The answer is a lot. And when I draw the HOMO for this system, I'll fill in the phasing momentarily. It's the same picture. It's big on the ends. That's a correct picture of the shape of a HOMO for a diene and a LUMO for a diene. So now let's fill in the phasing. That's the second part. So the correct phasing for um, what, what comes out of Huckel theory for, uh, for the HOMO, for the highest occupied molecular orbital of a diene, has same phasing on the first two carbons and then opposite phasing on the second two. There's a single node where you flip the orbitals in a diene. There's just one node. And when we go to, to, the, um, to the LUMO, there's going to be two nodes in this molecule. So we flip the phasing. And then one more time, we flip the phasing. And so this is a correct description of the, of the HOMO and the LUMO for a four-atom diene system. <laughs> very powerful predictions we can make off of this very simple picture that comes out of Huckel theory. So if we walk back over and we come back to this question, why is it that you don't add to the end carbon in this case? I think if you were taking sophomore chem chemistry, you would have claimed Oh, that's because the product is less stable. No, that's not why you don't add to the middle carbons. It's not because the product's not less stable. Product stability, we'll see lots of cases of this later. Pro the most stable products form fastest in about half of all reactions. The other half of reactions, less stable products, sorry, more stable products form more slowly. The reason why you add to the ends here is because the empty orbital, the LUMO, is biggest on the ends. You'll overlap more effectively by reacting with the end carbons. And you make the same prediction when you're adding an electrophile. When an electrophile comes testing this out, looking for the place where the most reactive pair of electrons, where do the, does that most reactive pair of electrons spend most of its time? That most, that most reactive pair of electrons spends most of its time on the ends. And so if you're an electrophile, you're going to want to overlap with the ends because that's where that, that pair of electrons spends most of its time. And it has nothing to do with the stability of the resulting cation, right? If I draw the cation that would result 
uh, with reacting with one of those middle carbons, yeah, that's less stable, but that's not why you don't react with the middle carbons. It's all predicted by, by the shape of the HOMO and the LUMO. So the last system that's really going to be important up until we get to paracyclic reactions um, is going to be this pentadienyl system. So let me try to sketch out this five atom pi system here. And we'll draw in uh, uh, the orbitals and the phasing. There's going to be two nodes in this. And I'm going to try to super overemphasize this, the shape and size of this. Um, and I've, I've done it to make, to make the conclusion so pretty unmistakable here. This is kind of like this allyl system. Am I talking about an allyl anion or an allyl cation? Depends on how many electrons I put in here. If I put no electrons, I'm talking about this, sorry, pentadienyl cation. If I put two electrons, then I'm talking about a pentadienyl anion. So let's come and talk about this question I asked. So if you were a nucleophile, over here we, I think you know, oh, nucleophiles always add to the end of an allyl cation. We know that. Electrophiles always add to the end of an allyl anion. But when we come back over and we look at a pentadienyl cation, where's the most reactive atom? If you had to make a choice about where to add a nucleophile, would you add a nucleophile here to give a non-conjugated diene product? Yes. That's the most reactive site. The preferred product is the one that's not conjugated. And if you take an allyl, a pentadienyl anion, the fastest site for reaction is in the middle to give a non-conjugated product. And it doesn't matter if it's a, a pentadiene or a carbonyl system, you make some extended enolate, you react fastest in the middle to get a non-conjugated product. And that's all predicted by Huckel theory. It all drops out of this simple memorization of these five. If you can memorize these five types of homos and lumos, and it's not even that much work because allyl and pentadienyl, there's only one orbital to memorize the shape of, you've got 90% of organic chemistry covered. You don't need to recalculate Huckel theory or memorize all these strange examples. If you just remember the phasing and orbital sizes on these four types of pi systems, you're set. So I expect you to do that. Yeah, did you have a question? Um, Yeah, I wasn't really trying to, I mean, here's what you need to remember is that it's easiest to remember for alkene, diene, triene. Remember there was this pinching effect that occurs as we add more and more conjugation. So I expect you to know that from the last lecture, that as you conjugate more and more alkenes or carbonyls or benzene rings with things, that you're going to raise the homo and lower the lumo. More nucleophilic and easier to add. Um, with these ones that are three atoms or five atoms, the, the, for an all carbon system, it's always sort of at this midline. So the, I did intentionally draw this at the midline here for the three, for the odd numbered uh, atom systems. Three, three atoms, five atoms, seven atoms, et cetera. Yeah, so you need to, to sort of remember those effects of conjugation uh, and the fact that the odd number atom systems are sort of at the, the midline for energy level. They've got the same energy as just simple p orbitals. This is the energy of a carbon p orbital right here if you didn't mix anything. Okay, so, wow, powerful predictive stuff just from Huckel theory. Who would have known that? Okay, I want to talk about uh, another simple pattern of reactivity and make two points. So I want to draw a simple carbonyl. Could be formaldehyde or acetone, doesn't matter. This is kind of generic. And I want to talk about reaction with a hydroxide anion. And whether you know it or not, there's a regiochemical issue embedded in this. You might immediately rule one of these out, 
there's two possible ways to attack any Pi system from a Berge Dunnett's like trajectory. 109 degree angle, Berge Dunnett's angle. And so which of those is, is, is the prediction that you would make? So in sophomore organic chemistry, uh, or maybe even freshman chemistry, you might have learned that there's partial charges here. Uh, and I think just based solely on that, you could make the correct prediction. We all know, that, it's almost like it's not worth talking about. We all know that hydroxide would want to attack the carbonyl and not the oxygen. And you could just look at the charge distribution uh, or the, the formal charges or the actual charge and, and make some guesses about that. So you can use charge to explain regiochemistry. You can also use molecular orbitals to explain the regiochemistry. And so I'm going to, I don't have a lot of room under here, so I'll try to draw my, my MO diagram to depict the HOMO and the LUMO for a carbonyl group. It's a pi system, so there's a HOMO and there's a LUMO. They look kind of like that alkene, that canonical alkene case. So here's pi, that's the HOMO. Here's pi star, that's the LUMO for that CO bond. And if we sketch that out, it, it's not like simple ethylene anymore. So here's my oxygen atom. I'm drawing it really small in the center there. So for my HOMO, the highest occupied molecular orbital, the phasing is the same on both of those two p orbitals, but the sizes are different. And it's kind of rational, I, I think here. Maybe it's rational. It, maybe it seems rational to me that for the filled MO, the one that has the electrons in there. If I were an electron, I've got this reversed. <laughs> what, what, as soon as I start to rationalize it, I realize, what am I? <laughs> OK, let me fix that. I'm getting all excited about the Berge Dunn single. So you guys, so it's kind of rational, isn't it? That if you were a pair of electrons, wouldn't you want to spend your time hovering around the most electronegative atom? The one that has the most of the charge? I would. That's the, if I were, a, the, the, the nucleus of oxygen has more positive charge than the nucleus of carbon. I'd want to spend, if I were an electron, I'd want to spend my time there. So it makes sense that there's this distortion in the shape of pi star for a carbonyl group. That makes sense. It just makes sense based on that's where electrons want to be. And if I had to carve electrons out of a pi system and take them away, would I want to take those electrons away from carbon or from oxygen. So the phasing we predicted, the phasing is the same. It doesn't matter whether you switch oxygen for carbon or nitrogen for carbon, the phasing stays the same. But changing to a more electronegative atom distorts the shape of the MOs. And so if I had to take electrons away and have an empty orbital somewhere, I'd want it to be more empty above carbon, not above oxygen. Oxygen's the electronegative atom. So the empty orbital, so the filled orbital is big on the electronegative atom, electronegative atom. And in this case, the empty orbital is big on the electropositive. And I don't, there's no, I'll just write EP for electropositive atom. So that kind of makes sense. And all, what drops out of this is this very powerful Berge Dunnett's angle that when you, when you interact with some sort of a, a nucleophile in a filled orbital, that you come in from this trajectory that has very profound implications for stereoselectivity in organic chemistry. So again, it took a crystallographer looking at structures to, to understand this trajectory. But actually, you could have guessed this just by thinking about MOs and Huckel theory. That stuff was, was around for decades before Berge and Dunnitz um, drew, the, drew their conclusions about trajectories for attack of nucleophiles on carbonyls. OK, so that's really powerful. Lumo coefficients are explained by positive charge. I'm going to add one little um, change to our title here. To put things, make things a little more clear. So when you took sophomore organic chemistry, everything made sense. And it made sense because we were super careful to show you only the examples where the LUMO coefficients were the same as the charge. We totally flim-flammed you. I'm, in fact, next quarter I'm going to teach Chem 51, Sophomore Organic Chemistry, and I'm going to go in and I'm going to scam everybody in there 
with this. I'm going to carefully pick and call my examples so I only show people cases where the LUMO coefficients correspond to charge so that you can predict everything with charge. And when people walk out of there, they're going to be like, yeah, I can predict everything. And then finally, when they go look at real chemistry, they'll be like, it doesn't make sense. It's like they walked out of the store with a defective item and they don't know what's wrong with it. And so let's try to, let's come back and try to understand what are the cases where it doesn't make sense and where it doesn't work. Let's take another case where charge sometimes explains the, the regiochemistry. And I'm going to take an enone now instead of a carbonyl, just a simple carbonyl. All I'm going to do is I'm just going to conjugate on another pi system. And my prediction ought to be, I think, that most nucleophiles are going to attack that carbonyl carbon. If I look at the charge di distribution, if I go do some calculation, um, an ab initio calculation, and you might argue what the validity of these numbers is, is a, uh, but it's a good way to think about the charges on these carbon atoms. There is a lot more positive charge on the carbonyl carbon than on that beta carbon on the end. If, and let me just put the sign here to be clear. This is how much positive charge there is located at each of those positions. So you shouldn't be at all surprised to find that, that nucleophiles attack the carbonyl carbon. That was the same prediction that you made with with a simple carbonyl with acetone or formaldehyde. But now, let's come and look at the MO case. So if I draw out the molecular orbitals here for an enone, I'm going to have some pi-like molecular orbitals that's the HOMO and the LUMO. We're not that interested in, in the um, and I hope I've got enough room. So what, so let's just imagine that this, so let's come back to the case I just told you you need to memorize. You need to memorize the shape of the HOMO and the LUMO for a simple diene. And what you need to, uh, and we'll come back and talk about this, because that shape is going to apply to this enone as well as it applies to this. First thing I want to do is I want to talk about what happens when we replace a carbon atom of a diene with an oxygen atom. If I take a carbon atom out and I stick it in an oxygen atom in its place, all of the MOs that involve that atom will drop in energy. So when I drop down and I talk about the energy levels here, <clears throat> for the enone system, that would explain to me why enones are less nucleophilic and more electrophilic than a simple diene. So you kind of knew, of course, not kind of, you already knew it's easier to add a nucleophile to an enone than to add it to, to butadiene. You knew that already. And it's because of this. When you replace with a more electronegative atom, um, all of those orbitals drop in energy. So if I draw the picture of this LUMO, what does that tell me? What I'm going to do is I'm going to start by drawing the phasing, or actually what, I'm going to have to draw the, the sizes of these. So remember what I said about um, the sizes of orbitals for a diene. For a simple diene like butadiene, the orbitals are bigger on the end. It's the same as butadiene. It's not exactly symmetrical anymore. There's going to be some slight distortion, and I'm not good at, at drawing that distortion. The phasing will be the same as butadiene. There's two nodes where you flip from hashed on top to unhashed on the bottom. So this is a picture of, of, of acrolein, this, this alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl compound. And so now, if I look at the actual coefficients, I'm not, again, I'm not doing a good job of showing you the size, but the, but the Huckel orbital, p orbital coefficients that you see here look like this. It's actually a little bit bigger here on this end carbon. And the, the, the true volume of this, when you actually look at the shape of, of the, the LUMO, the molecular orbital, it, it corresponds to the square of these numbers, not the actual number. 
kind of magnifies small differences. Small differences here are meaningful because you're interested in the square of these two numbers. This is how much p character you mix in. You mix in about two thirds of a p orbital to create this, this molecular orbital, the LUMO. And the rest of that p orbital gets mixed into other orbitals that are lower in energy or higher in energy. That's where the rest of the p orbital, but about 62% of that p orbital gets used to make this molecular orbital, according to Huckel theory. Okay, so this gives you pretty strong predictions. You're going to either, what this picture is telling you is that nucleophiles are going to either add to oxygen or to carbon unless there's something you don't like about adding to oxygen. And that's where you can sort of map in the effective charge. Well, if I've got two choices, I'm going to fall on this choice, right? So the prediction is, if charge isn't important, if charge is not important and you had to make a choice to add here or here, where would you rather add? When you have nucleophiles that don't have a lot of charge, you're going to add to the end. That's the very strong prediction that you get. So in cases where the, I, I drew a nucleophile and I, I suggestively wrote a negative charge. Actually, let me try to sketch it out on here. So if you take the kinds of nucleophiles that will attack this carbonyl, those will be things like a fluoride anion, really focused negative charge. Hydroxide anion, another second row atom, small. The negative charge is there associated with oxygen. That will attack the carbonyl carbon the fastest. <clears throat> if I take an alkyl lithium, for example, another second row atom. Lithium is so electropositive. We'll talk more about alkyl lithiums. But there's a ton of negative charge on that carbon because lithium is so electropositive. It's clear on the other side of the periodic table. There's a lot of negative charge associated with this. All of these will react faster with the carbonyl carbon. Now what kinds of nucleophiles would react over here? It's going to be things where there's not a lot of negative charge, where charge is not really an important factor, where this picture over here is the important factor. And so when I come over and look at some of those, what would be my ideal uncharged nucleophile? This is, this is the nucleophile I usually ask myself if I'm trying to think about LUMO interactions and use my intuition. Where would a phosphine want to add? Orbitals are very big for a phosphine lone pair. There's not a lot of negative charge on a phosphine atom. This thing is already overlapping before any electronegative character from this, any partial minus character from this gets even close to that. There's already orbital overlap. Phosphines react faster at the end carbon, not at the carbonyl. Other big atoms will do the same. Even though there's a, there's a negative charge on selenium, like oxygen, sulfur, selenium is so big, the orbitals are so big. There's not like a focused negative charge on this. Sulfur, I love thiolate anion nucleophiles because they don't confuse us with this charge st stuff. The charge is so diffuse, you're, uh, the orbitals are so big relative to the location of that charge. You can mainly think about MO interactions to think about what thiolate anions are going to do. And probably the one that's most important for organic synthesis are things that form carbon-carbon um, bonds. Stabilized carbanions. And if you're taking Chem 204, organic synthesis, you start off talking about enolate chemistry because CC bond formation is important. And enolates are the way to go. And when you look at this system, I've drawn it to make it look like the negative charge on carbon. There is very little negative charge on carbon. Almost all the negative charge is located on the oxygen atom. So the interaction with, the, with this nucleophile and that electrophile is not dominated by charge. It's dominated by um, the fact that the HOMO is biggest on this carbon. And so when you come over here and ask, where is the LUMO the biggest, it tells you that a stabilized enolate that doesn't have much charge on carbon is going to prefer to react here. Any nucleophile that doesn't have a focused negative charge is going to prefer to react on, on, at the beta carbon. So again, let me just give these the labels here, alpha and beta. So that's the preferred site for things that don't have a lot of charge. Okay, so this is what kills you after you take um, undergraduate organic chemistry, is that there's all these cases where charge and LUMO don't give you the same prediction. And so you have to look at whether the nucleophile has a lot of negative charge or not. Otherwise you'll reach the wrong prediction. It's only with really negatively charged nucleophiles that, that that stuff is true. Okay, so let's take the same kind of thinking 
that both charge can be important for some nucleophiles <clears throat> and orbitals can be important for other types of nucleophiles and, and take the, the same thinking and apply it to electrophiles. Okay, I'm going to start off by talking about a simple reaction, and that is enolates again. This is most of modern organic synthesis is stuff like enolates. It's not like alkoxides, the stuff you learn in sophomore organic chemistry. You don't use that to build organic molecules. <clears throat> and so we have a choice here about what's going to be the most reactive. If I take electrophiles and I react them with enolates, you can see there's a negative charge on oxygen. And if you look at the calculated charges, the charges you get depend on the level of theory at which you calculate. But almost all levels of theory would predict that there's more negative charge. That's supposed to be minus 0.45. Almost a half a negative charge on that oxygen atom and only about a third of a negative charge here in this carbon atom. It's like, where's the rest of the negative charge? It's distributed on the other atoms in the molecule would be the prediction. We'll do some of that. We'll look at some of those pictures later in the quarter. Okay, so charge explains the regiochemistry sometimes, but LUMO, sorry, the, the, the HOMO explains regiochemistry in, in other cases. So this is the charge picture, and here's the MO picture. So if we're interested in this acting as a nucleophile, we need to think about the HOMO for that. And so how do we go about doing that? It's a three-atom pi system. And so what's, what's our picture for a three-atom pi system? It was that allyl anion. And if it's an allyl anion, there's two electrons in that middle orbital. Let me sketch out that, that, that orbi the orbital picture for an allyl anion. It looked like this. There was a single node in the middle. That's the MO picture for an allyl anion. And so what happens if I replace a carbon atom of, of an allyl anion with an oxygen atom? All of these orbitals will now drop in energy. So when I switch over to thinking about an enolate, I need to draw the same three orbitals here, where now, I'm sorry, you, it's kind of hidden underneath the board here, but that's that one below. We don't care about that orbital anyways, who cares? <laughs> so let me draw out the enolate where the, there's the oxygen. And again, here's these orbitals. It's the biggest on the ends, and there's this phasing associated here. And I don't know how important it is at this point in time, but this is not exactly the same. It's not symmetrical anymore. And once I've made it non-symmetrical, there's a little bit of P character that gets mixed in here. And we'll talk about the implications for that later. But it's so small, don't worry about it for now. Don't worry about that. If you wanted to use this picture, you would reach all of the correct conclusions here by using this picture where there's no P character in that middle atom. This, this picture is telling you there's two reactive ends here. And I didn't do a good job. Let me, try to, right, let me try to fix this so I do a better job, so you'll remember it. There we go. That's what I meant to draw, so that the prediction's easy. It's not even close to the same size on each end. It's not even close. The, the, the HOMO for, for an enolate anion is way, way bigger on carbon. And I'll draw out the HOMO coefficients that, you, that come out, out of molecular orbital theory. Remember, it's the square of these numbers that, that sort of relates to volume or orbital overlap. And once you square it, those differences become very big. So if I were some electrophile getting closer and closer to this, looking for where I could overlap, this picture tells me that the most reactive pair of this electron spends most of its time above carbon and not so much time above oxygen. So if I want to overlap effectively with my empty orbital, I'm going to tend to land on top of the carbon and not on the oxygen atom. And so which picture is more important, charge or, or MO? That depends. Are you interested in forming salts or are you interested in forming carbon-carbon bonds? This is the more important picture. If you're interested in making bonds like an organic chemist, then this is the picture that matters to you. So what kinds of electrophiles would react fastest here on oxygen? Things with a very focused positive charge, with a lot of positive charge. So what kinds of electrophiles react on oxygen fastest? A lithium cation, a sodium cation. And again, that's not very interesting to me. 
zinc cations, even if there's halides attached to there. <clears throat> Here's something that's interesting, but not, um, that's supposed to be trimethyl. Trimethyl silochlorides, silohalides, silotriflates. Silicon is very electropositive and reacts fastest on oxygen. It's dominated by charge. The interaction is dominated by charge. That is interesting. That's why when you take enolates and treat them with TMS halides, you get silylenol ethers, o -silo. You get o -silylation. There's a few cases where you get c -silylation. Okay. Some carbonyls will react faster on oxygen. And this may screw some of you in the lab when you're trying to make carbon-carbon bonds. For example, acetic anhydride. I've got most of this electron density is donating into this carbon. There's very little donating into here. This is an electronegative oxygen atom. It makes this carbon much more positive. Or if I take an acid chloride, these two types of, of carbonyl compounds give you ma mainly o acylation reactions. <clears throat> So what do you need if you want to make carbon-carbon bonds over here with this alpha carbon next to the carbonyl? What kind of electrophile would you want? Well, the kinds that you use in the lab. Methyl iodide. Why is methyl iodide reactive? It has nothing to do with partial positive charge on carbon. That's not why methyl iodide is reactive. Sigma star is huge. There's this long, weak bond there. Sigma star is huge. Pauling originally assigned carbon to be more electronegative than iodine. So if you were going to make some prediction, you'd say iodine is more positive. That, that, that picture has been refined a little bit. Benzyl bromide. Uh, let me draw out the... Or, or allyl bromide. That's easier for me to fit here. Again, why is allyl bromide so reactive? It's not because of partial positive charge on carbon. Aldehydes. What's the difference between an aldehyde and an acid chloride? Well, now it's a proton there, not, not a halide. There's not as much partial positive charge. And of course, this is why enolate chemistry dominates organic synthesis, because you can form carbon-carbon bonds and not get messed up by forming carbon-oxygen bonds. OK, so if you know something about, um, about those systems, you can make very powerful predictions or, or rationalize why this is the best picture and why you should be thinking about homos and lumos and not charge when you want to think about carbon-carbon bond forming reactions. Okay, I want to come back and finish up by talking about an example that I brought up on the first day. And try to separate. Um, now that we're all powered up by thinking about the difference between charge and MO interactions, <clears throat> let's come back to what I talked about on day one. So on day one, I, I, I brought up this example of taking some sort of an electrophile and reacting with, with T-butoxide, potassium T-butoxide. So you can think of that as a T-butoxide anion. And there's two choices. The T-butoxide can either attack carbon and do an SN2 reaction, or it can deprotonate and do a, a concerted E2 elimination reaction. So the two outcomes here are attack on carbon versus an E2 elimination and attack on the proton that's beta. And it depends on what the leaving group is. So if an X is a tosylate, you can use this productively for an SN2 reaction. But if X is equal to a bromide, the outcome isn't quite so good. You get mainly E2 eliminate. If you were trying to form some interesting bond to carbon or oxygen, um, you're mainly going to get an uninteresting E2 elimination reaction. Right? Typically, that's not the kind of thing you're trying to do in organic synthesis. And so why is there this difference? The difference has to do with, let me go ahead and draw this out. I'll draw out the two starting materials. If I draw out the picture of a tosylate, um, O, SO2 tall, this is very electronegative. The reason why tosylates are so reactive is because there is a huge partial positive charge here. Let me just write delta plus there. There is a huge partial positive charge. 
Now the, the LUMO, or, or the antibonding orbital for this bond is very small, so I'll just write small sigma star. That's really not why tosylates are so reactive. But if I draw the, the, the corresponding structure for a bromide, and let me superemphasize this long, weak bond for that alkyl bromide. Even better for an iodide. Long bond, weak bond. That is a very easy bond to break. And it's easy to break because you've got this huge, low energy LUMO. Alkyl bromides have about the same speeds of reactivity as alkyl tosylates, but for completely different reasons. So the reason why alkyl bromides are reactive is because sigma star is so big. There is very little, um, I'll just draw a little delta plus here. I'll draw that very diminutive. There's very little partial positive charge on an alkyl bromide. Most of the positive charge is on the protons. And so when you come along with T-butoxide, which is negative, of course it attacks the proton. <clears throat> Whereas you come over here where there's this huge partial positive charge on carbon on the tosylate, there's a very productive interaction between T-butoxide and that carbon of a tosylate. So if you wanted, really, to magnify the effects of, of the HOMO and not get messed up by the charge interaction, um, I always like to think of as thylates as my best nucleophiles. And when I say nucleophile, I'm, I'm talking about attacking carbon, not attacking protons. Just the word nucleophile implies you're not attacking a proton. <clears throat> so let me just bring up a, um, the case that works in, no matter what X is, reliably. So I take a thylate anion. And again, the, the huge orbital, there's not this focused negative charge. No matter what I do, this reaction is not going to be dominated by charge once I drop below that second row to third row or fourth row atoms. And so now it doesn't matter what, what the leaving group is. Tosylate, bromide, or iodide, you end up getting attack. <clears throat> at the carbon atom because it, it can't, the interaction can't be dominated by charge when there's not a focused negative charge there. It has to be dominated by that LUMO interaction. So even though in the case of the tosylate it's small there, that's all you've got. You don't have the charge. Okay, so um, that's it. So we're going to finish up, um, actually not finish up, when we come back on Monday we're going to start talking, we're going to spend a couple of lectures maybe three, talking about the chemistry of third row atoms, sulfur and phosphorus. You don't get enough of, the, of those particular mechanisms when you take sophomore organic chemistry, and it's different from carbon. And so we're going to spend next week learning all about that, phosphorus and sulfur. Okay, I'll see you guys on Monday morning.